Director of the Conservancy, Angela Avery, and she's going to kick things off. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to make one very brief comment, and I want to thank Secretary Crowfoot and all of the uh, speakers uh, at the uh, uh, Climate Resilience uh, 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 Symposium that we had here earlier. Uh, I think we all learned quite a bit about the uh, problems and challenges facing the state and in particular uh, the Sierra Nevada and uh, the only way we're going to reach our goals uh, and address uh, the challenges of climate change and uh, other issues that uh, are major uh, obstacles uh, to the Sierra Nevada uh, is if we uh, work together the local government, uh, private entities, uh, volunteers and so uh, I hope you all go home and be thinking about what all of us together can do to um, preserve the, the wonderful uh, environment that is the uh, Sierra Nevada. And so with that, I want to introduce uh, Angela Avery. Angie? you who um, are here still with us for, as Terry said, this the sixth annual Watershed Improvement Program Summit. Um, I think most of you know who the Sierra Nevada Conservancy is. We talked about it a little bit earlier, so I won't go into much to, to into too much detail there. Um, but I'll echo Terry's sentiments to the Secretary for highlighting the needs and issues um, in the Sierra Nevada in his speaker series. Um, I think that the conversation and the topics that were discussed with that panel really set an amazing foundation for what we're going to be bringing to you in this afternoon session here at um, our 6th Annual Watershed Improvement Program Summit. SNC has hosted multiple summits over the years. We, um, starting in 2015 when we launched the Watershed Improvement Program, um, with each summit featuring top scientists and policy and decision makers um, to make sure that what's being talked about in Sacramento is understood in the region and what the real needs and issues in the region are are being understood in Sacramento by the folks who are making policy decisions. And there is a lot of conversation going on right now in Sacramento around resilience, so I do not think we could be timelier in finally bringing to you an effort that's been a couple of years in the making and that is the science work, the science foundation work that's coming out of the Watershed Improvement Program's first pilot project, the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative area. Um, folks in Sacramento, there's a couple of, I think someone mentioned it earlier, there are a couple of bonds, resilient bond, resilience bond measures that are being considered. There are a couple of companion bills that are looking at um, two bond measures that are looking at things like, um, you know, developing actions that get us to a state of resilience. Um, there's a bond, uh, or there's another bill out there that is looking at and trying to consider ways to do some spatial planning to make sure that we are identifying projects that ensure that California's water supply stays resilient. And a lot of the conversations have a lot of similar topics in, what, in what's being discussed. So some of the things that, um, in their own ways, each of these mechanisms is looking to do include developing a resiliency framework guided by best, best available science, include all levels of government and other entities and processes and collaborations um, that will identify and align funding sources to pay for projects that are needed to move a landscape to resilience, track and measure outcomes 
of projects and investments designed to build climate resilience. And so part of the reason I'm so excited about what we're gonna share with you today after so much time investing in it and thinking about it um, is because there's a direct connection what's with what's happening on the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative area and what is being discussed in Sacramento now. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative area, the TCSI was launched in 2017 with, this, with the idea that we needed to be accelerating in a meaningful way uh, large landscape scale forest and watershed restoration by developing and demonstrating innovative planning, innovative ways to do investment, new management tools across, across this 2.4 million acre landscape, but doing it across local, private, U.S. Forest Service and state lands. So really this all lands concept. The TCSI landscape is about 2.4 million acres and it's at the, um, and it, it, it was about 2.4 million Excuse me. Um, the efforts on that landscape really are intended to ensure that um, the wide variety of benefits on that landscape continue to provide into the future. So today, what are we talking about today? Today we're introducing what we're calling the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative Roadmap to Resilience, a model for the Sierra Nevada, and I would go so far as to say potentially beyond. The TCSI science process that will be highlighted for you today includes <coughs> defining resilience, doing a deep dive scientific assessment of the landscape, developing and implementing projects to achieve resilience goals. This work is already answering legislative calls to action and can inform developing um, policy decisions. It's a top-down, bottom-up scientific process that we believe can create a roadmap to resilience by understanding what actions on the ground meet climate goals, by utilizing applied science, by outlining a plan that reflects local values, local goals, and local knowledge, and embraces all of the people invested in a landscape to achieve those goals, we think that's the path to resilience. We think that's the way, that's the hope that we were talking about earlier. Um, that's a way forward in the face of some of the terrifying items that Hugh highlighted <laughs> in his presentation earlier. Um, so, but in addition to the science framework that's coming out of the TCSI, we also wanted to showcase here two examples of the way that the TCSI science modeling assessment and new tools um, are actually being used on the ground and how they're, we're, we're already thinking about using new tools like LIDAR in land management planning um, that are topics of conversation, like I said, that are, are, are relevant in policy discussions right now. So we want to showcase um, what's going on there. So not only will you hear about the science, but you'll also hear today about a 250,000 acre project in the TCSI landscape. It's called the North Yuba Forest Project, which is a multi-sector collaborative, again, using the most current tools, and um, Becky Estes is here to talk with us about that. But because we don't get to resilience, and thinking again the way that Steve Frisch defined resilience as environmental, economic, and social, sort of the whole enchilada, if you will, you don't get to resilience if you're taking product, wood, and biomass out of a out of a forest in a restoration project if you don't have a place to bring it, and if you don't have people to work in the place that you bring it. So we do need to be thinking holistically about this, and so we have Dan Porter here from the Nature Conservancy uh, to talk to us about um, a wood products analysis that TNC has done on the TCSI landscape, which I think starts to get to some of those to answer some of those questions. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, I want to also acknowledge CAL FIRE on this because this research is um, primarily funded through the CCI, California Climate Investment Grant that the SNC and some of the TCSI partners received. Um, that is funding, so it's funding a significant amount of this research, but that's being done in the context of a very large set of projects and on the ground work that are achieving California climate goals. So it's important to note today um, that we're presenting the science and the science effort and the processes that are coming out of the TCSI landscape. This is 2.4 million acres of, of 25 million acres in the landscape. It's one um, sort of coalition of collaboratives, because it's not just a collaborative in its traditional sense. It's a coalition of people who are working individually. But it's not the only thing going on in the, two point, in the 25 million acres that make up the Sierra Nevada region. 
There are some local efforts that are linking to the work and research that Pat Manley and um, Kristen Wilson have been doing um, around what, is a, what are the pillars of resilience? What does resilience look like across the Sierra Nevada um, range? How does it apply to this landscape is the question that they're asking. But in Butte County, the Sacramento River Watershed Program is working with the Butte County Fire State Council using the pillars of resilience that de were defined in this project and connecting to uh, uh, county wildfire protection plans and other general plan elements, and they're developing a local plan for implementing projects in that landscape in response to the campfire in a way that we haven't seen before. And it's building off of some of the work that goes, that's going on here. Additionally, there's a group called the Yosemite Stanislaus, Stanislaus Solutions Group that is working out of um, this, working in partnership with the Stanislaus National Forest to embrace another scenario, land management scenario planning, planning tool. It's a different effort, um, and it's an important effort, and it's, you know, maybe there are ways for us to connect this, we still to be seen. Um, but my point here in bringing up these other efforts is that the folks who live and work in the Sierra Nevada understand the urgency and the need not only for action now, which we are doing, we are actually trying to address the issues on the ground, but more importantly for setting real goals that are resilience-based, that have that triple bottom line in mind. Finding pathways to get to those goals and get that work on the ground in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, and so I'm super excited to introduce Nick Instis, who will introduce our other speakers here today, um, and we'll moderate not only the presentations that they're doing, but the question and answer period that will follow. And we do really hope to hear from you in that section. I'm, I'm curious to hear your, um, if you're policy makers or funding and decision makers, you know, what is your reaction to what the process is here today? But if you're local folks, do you see value in this? We're really interested in having that conversation with you. So without further ado, um, uh, Nick Instis is a Sierra Nevada Conservancy's regional scientist, and he will be moderating and introducing our speaker. So thank you again for being here. I'm really excited to hear what you think and to have our presenters tell you what they've been working on for the last couple of years. So thanks again. Thank you, Angie, and good afternoon, and welcome, everybody, to a dive into some of the work occurring in our WIP analysis area um, and our pilot area, the TCSI. We have invested heavily with partners in the TCSI with the hope that the work there may help guide work elsewhere throughout the region, and it's our pleasure to showcase some of that work with you here today. Our four presenters will be sharing details on the tools they're developing in collaboration with stakeholders to evaluate and plan for resilience. Please take note of your questions as we move through the presentations. As Angie mentioned, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the four presentations, and we will get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. And with that in mind, and, uh, I would like to go ahead and bring up our first presenters, uh, Pat and Kristen. Pat Manley is a research program manager at the Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station. A lead scientist on a variety of groundbreaking studies in the Sierra Nevada, Pat's research focuses on natural and human factors affecting biological diversity. She's a key contributor in the design and analysis of national protocols for monitoring multiple species and their habitats. Kristen Wilson is an ecologist for the Nature Conservancy. With over 10 years of experience in the Sierra Nevada region, Kristen researches watershed planning and the impacts of restoration projects. Her expertise in forest, meadow, and stream restoration projects helps land managers quantify ecosystem services and helps them identify trade-offs. And I will turn it over to you. Please, Pat. Great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, so thanks for, for attending. Um, as, as Nick mentioned, uh, Kristen and I will trade off uh, during this presentation um, and talk to you uh, about how the TCSI uh, Science Foundation, why we're building it, um, what we think it can do for TCSI and what it could possibly do um, outside of that landscape and other landscapes in the Sierra Nevada and perhaps even um, throughout the Sierra, uh, the, the state I should say. So um, why are we here today? We heard the, the setup this morning uh, or this, early this afternoon with the, the speaker series was a perfect setup. Um, so really, you know, we've been doing watershed management for the last 100 years and, and uh, arguably maybe for centuries uh, in the Sierra Nevada. 
And, um, but the world has changed a lot in the last, particularly in the last 100 years. Or, and so what, what's really different? We have climate change, we have urban development, um, and we have population growth, and we also have an understanding that these systems are more complex um, than we ever imagined they would be, or they are. And so there's no such thing as a simple solution anymore, but there are solutions. And I think that the, the challenge ahead of us is to leverage and adapt. So um, we've talked a lot about and understood how these systems are changing. This part of the day is a little bit about how we can change. And I think there's lots of promise and opportunity there. So the objectives for today are just to provide an overview of what, how we're building the scientific foundation and why we're doing that, um, and then also how it can serve the rest of the state. So Kristen and I are going to cover these five basic steps um, from the framework, the overarching kind of philosophy and approach and science foundation for resilience, all the way to project planning and implementation. This um, graphic kind of walks through this process in a, in a little more detail. Um, so the framework itself is really about um, why we're doing things, why, why might you want to have uh, achieve resilience, and, and uh, the assessment is where are we today, what might the future look like, uh, and then the roadmap is how do we bring it all together to how to move this landscape into a, desired, a more desirable condition into the future. So you might think of this as a bit of a recipe, that's how I like to think of it, <laughs> um, and that we, there are key ingredients that matter to resilience. There are things that matter to resilience, and those are pretty you know, ubiquitous. Uh, what ingredients you might have, what quality ingredients you might have to, to run this pathway, this pipeline from the framework to the roadmap, may vary from place to place, as, as Angie was just, uh, just describing. But essentially, um, the problem is the same in the sense of starting at these various scales and, and working our way down to understanding what it is you really, what options you really have to move forward. So, in terms of the framework for resilience, um, you know, resilience is a very attractive uh, concept. It shows up in a lot of our plans in the state and federal side of the houses. Um, and uh, it's, but it's also a really intangible, sometimes difficult concept to bring into uh, specifics, both in terms of uh, what it is you want and, and how to measure success. So this, the, the idea of developing a framework for resilience was really to kind of fast track this process. A lot of, a lot of folks at the collaboratives um, at various scales kind of wrestle with this idea of resilience, and it can take up a lot of time to, under, to talk through, well, what does it really mean? And there are a lot of um, sort of conflicting notions in that concept that folks have to work out. So the whole purpose of this was really to provide uh, a science, a well-founded, scientifically-based set of definitions, guiding principles, um, and scale-specific metrics that can be used and adopted for large landscapes anywhere in the Sierra Nevada. And quite possibly beyond that as well, I think, with some, probably some tweaks. Um, so one of the things that we did toward this end, and again, this is, all this work is really represented by so many people that um, uh, would probably put you all asleep to, to um, uh, acknowledge them all now, but I just, I want to make sure that folks know there's probably, you know, 100 people that contribute to, to this work that we're presenting today. Um, so this was a weird workshop, and it was um, uh, supported by the California Tahoe Conservancy, SNC, and others, um, where we brought together leaders in science, in policy, and management for a two-day workshop to say, well, what does resilience really mean? How can we capture the essence of it? And, and the result was this, this uh, pillars of landscape resilience. Um, these are outcome-oriented. This is why we care about resilience. This is why we want resilience. These are the benefits um, that we're after and, and how they matter and what they look like. Um, two things, one is this interconnectedness uh, of environmental quality and community well-being, that there's no way you can have one without the other, they're entirely interdependent. And so this list of eight pillars really is a continuum uh, from uh, forested ecosystems all the way through socioeconomic well-being. So it's kind of an expanded triple bottom line, if you, if you will. The, um, the next thing I wanted to mention is and I can't go through all of these pieces of the framework, um, but I wanted to just touch on a couple of them. This, the second one is really that in order to accomplish uh, uh, you know, landscape resilience, you have to sort of work at the scale at which resilience, these pillars, these outcomes that we're interested in actually materialize, that you can manage toward them, that you can uh, create them, and that you can maintain them over time. Uh, and it's really this larger scale. So this idea of a regional resilience landscape has really sort of surfaced in, in our work in TCSI. And uh, this one to three or four or five million acre scale, it's not, you know, so there's flexibility around that, but it's that's the scale at which you have communities 
you know, they range all the way from communities to wilderness and everything in between, where you can create a, a, a market uh, or at least provide uh, substantial contributions toward market, um, you know, forces as well as uh, achieve and, and measure outcomes of benefits such as water or wildfire risk or biodiversity, uh, for instance. So these things are really something that we pull together, and the state has many plans, the Forest Service has a scale. So we're going to and how this effort is developing kind of at the top down goes to that scale and then the bottom up works from there. From below there up to there. So at this point I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to talk about the assessment. Thanks Pat. My name is Kristen Wilson. So Pat presented the and now I'm going to talk about the assessment of the year 2100. So we have current conditions and then future conditions managed out into the future. We think both the snapshot of current conditions as well as the dynamic future things. When you go in the forest, you need to have spatial data. The future modeling also gives us a chance to incorporate climate change as well as urban development and other factors that can influence how management actions on the ground fare well into the future. So it's helpful to have both that current view as well as that future view. This is definitely a work in progress right now, so I'm going to be sharing where we are and we expect to finish the assessment of current conditions this summer in June and the future scenario modeling this fall. For the assessment of current conditions, some of the factors that we're looking at are things like fire risk. So my colleague Ed Smith worked with Pyrologics, a contracting group, to map out where is the fire risk right now within TCSI, where is the greatest risk? This map is showing you burn probability. The areas in orange have a higher burn probability, and the areas in yellow have a lower burn probability. We can look at fire risk specifically to infrastructure. So where is the high fire risk uh, especially threatening for existing infrastructure? We can also think about how often would the forest have experienced fire uh, with a natural fire regime. So he was talking earlier about low, moderate, and high severity fires. We can think about how often would the forest have burned. Um, and that varies depending on where you are within this landscape. So that's what we consider the disturbance history. How often would the forest been disturbed by fire? And how often are we disturbing it with treatment right now? So we have both natural disturbances, fire and beetle, and human disturbances like ecological forestry, which we consider mechanical thinning, hand thinning, and prescribed fire. We can take into account operability. What parts of the landscape are too steep that we can't get mechanical equipment out there? What areas are close to roads? And what are the different land ownerships? Um, we can also really dive in on the forest structure. So the forest structure, going a step back, we have data from 2018 created by a group called Sylvia Terra. It's an amazing data set, 15 meter resolution. All the lands are included. This data set will really help us understand forest structure. What does it look like today, and how does it compare to reference conditions? I'll be talking more about that in a minute. We can also think about drought, drought vulnerability. This is work by Dr. Roger Bales. Uh, so what areas of the forest are particularly vulnerable to drought? We have areas of high vulnerability in orange, and areas of uh, lower vulnerability in purple. You can see that purple area is really following the, the crest of the, um, the uh, divide from the west slope to the east slope. And then finally, where are the California spotted owl areas that we need to, to take into account? We've narrowed down a list of 14 focal species with input from wildlife biologists with the Forest Service as well as other stakeholders in the landscape. We'll also look at biodiversity and carbon. So all of these things give us a complete picture of what the conditions are today. 
They're the, the things that we care about, the pillars that Pat mentioned earlier, that we need to map out and, and understand their, where they exist. A little bit deeper dive on current conditions of forest structure. We can go out and say, okay, the forest structure is a certain number of trees per acre out there right now, but what does it matter? We need to know how that compares to some reference, right? We need to be able to say, um, we know there's too many trees, but what, how many trees should be there? Or what should be the goal or the target? We're gonna rely in our assessment a lot on work done by Sean Geronimo and others to identify reference conditions that exist out in the landscape today. Those are small areas that don't have a history of timber harvest, that have been allowed to burn, um, and that represent places currently where the forest structure is something that we might want to emulate with our treatments. So these graphs are just showing you the difference in the reference conditions for the, the yellow zone on the right. That's a map zoning up the TCSI landscape based on climate into different zones. So as you go up in elevational bands, you can see those colors changing. And it's not just the temperature, it's also the precipitation and evapotranspiration. So we can look at tree density and basal area for our structure measures that we can change and, and know that current conditions in TCSI, that's the bold line on the left graph, there are too many trees out there, we know. But within this zone, what's called warm, dry, low montane, how far would we have to go to get to reference conditions? That's in the dashed line. Um, so we can really get specific about forest conditions and how, um, how many trees we would have to remove where to reach a resilient condition based on those references. We can go even further down in scale from those climate zones that you saw on the map before to landscape management units. So what should the forest structure be compared to reference in an even smaller scale? Ridges, valleys, northeast and southwest slopes. This allows you to go further down in scale and get a more specific view of, of the forest structure. Okay, that was the current assessment. Now I'm gonna talk about the future assessment. So modeling, scenario modeling. We are gonna model out six different scenarios of forest management. They go from scenario one, which is just gonna be treating areas around infrastructure and on private industrial lands. So modeling out treatment that's happening on private industrial lands, like a timber harvest, as well as treatments that would happen around existing infrastructure only. That's scenario one. In scenarios five and six, we're treating much more of a landscape and trying to re reach that fire return interval, that period of time where we think fire would have occurred on the landscape. We're modeling how our own treatments, thinning, burning, prescribed fire, can be done on a frequency to match that fire return interval so that you have this mix of both fire disturbance as well as human disturbance getting you to a more resilient state. You're disturbing the forest at the same interval that it would have been historically been burning at. The uh, urban development scenario helps us understand how growth is gonna change through the year 2100. And then the climate models bound the uncertainty in the future. So we know that the, the climate is gonna change and we need to make sure that we represent the hotter, drier future and the wetter, cooler future and that we can understand how our management actions uh, impact the things we care about. How do they change the wildlife habitat? How do those scenarios of management change the fire risk, especially for high severity fires? How do they change the um, emissions, carbon emissions? And how do they impact wood supply? Which is what Dan will be presenting a little bit later. This is the model running right now, uh, showing you scenario one. So I'm gonna show you three different scenarios of treatment. And the dark red areas are showing you where in the landscape is being treated within the model. This is just one climate model that I'm showing you. There are two. And this is just one replicate of one climate model. There'll be 10 in the future for each model. The point here is that in scenario one, it's treating in areas around infrastructure those colors in the background, you can see the, the orangey red color that's showing you the corridor of I-80. Uh, you can see the development around Lake Tahoe as well as in the foothills. And the treatments are occurring in those areas where there's development. 
The treatments are also occurring, like I mentioned, on private industrial lands. Those are the checkerboard lands that you can see on the map. As we move to scenario three, the amount of treatment increases across the landscape. So now the treatments are going into the general forest area. And again, these are ecological treatments that we're talking about. So in the case of national forest land, it's not removing large trees. It's creating healthy forest conditions by removing basically a lot of small trees and creating the heterogeneity that we think existed that's important for wildlife and for forest health. And then finally, I'm going to show scenario five. And this is over 10 years of treatment. Um, it represents an increase from roughly 14,000 acres per year in scenario one. And in scenario five and six, the two highest levels of treatment, we're modeling out about 70,000 acres of treatment per year. You may be like, that's a lot. Look at all that dark red across the landscape. And if you think about it, this area actually represents about 27% of the TCSI landscape. Um, so it's not, it's not huge. It's a big increase from where we are now, but it's not um, unrealistic. And then finally, I'm going to uh, just say that the point of all this future modeling is to really figure out how those scenarios compare on the things we care about. You know, does scenario one get us the fire risk reduction that we, we think we need? Does scenario three get us enough fire risk reduction? Is there a trade-off between fire risk reduction, for example, and um, wildlife habitat? We'll be able to understand these dynamics through the modeling. So I'm going to pass it back to Pat, who's going to talk about the final part of our TCSI sites. Um, so just to pick up where Kristen left off, um, uh, this is an example of uh, one set of outputs for a particular metric related to the, the, one of those pillars, fire, um, the fire regime and functional fire across the landscape. So in this particular case, we focus on a, uh, this, this data are from the Lake Tahoe West uh, partnership, restoration partnership. So this is, these are not data from TCS, well they're from a part of TCSI, but we'll be um, generating information like this using a similar approach um, and uh, for the entire TCSI landscape, but wanted to again forecast a little bit about where this is going. Um, so what we have the opportunity to do in this singular uh, metric is to be able to look at what are the effects of these scenarios. This is a little different set of scenarios, but similar in the sense that they go from the far left, meaning no treatment suppression only, all the way to the the greatest amount of treatment on the right, uh, and then the far two right, uh, there's a trade-off between whether you're using mechanical treatment or fire. So there's, and this is a cumulative acres burned at the large patches of high severity fire, something that is certainly um, just about on every list of uh, things folks would like a little less of. Um, so what, kind of three things about this particular graph. One is that, that um, we see that uh, management Ha actually has an impact. So uh, the, the, all the different colors are different climate models, so we understand what the variability is that's simply related to climate. And what we've learned from this is that management can have a, a significant effect on reducing the risk of large patches of high security fire. That's great news. Uh, the second is that the proportion of the landscape treated is, is, uh, is a directly related to the degree of risk reduction. That's also pretty great news. And it also sets us up for understanding, so how much input do we want to put in this landscape? And how much do we want to have this kind of outcome uh, as a result? And the third is that, um, that as you move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, you see that you can't really have a significant impact on this particular variable unless you're treating outside the buoy. The treating inside the buoy alone does not significantly reduce the risk of high-intensity large patches of fire. So I think that this is something that we um, will wrestle with, of course. <laughs> uh, but it means that getting out into the, the landscape as a whole is probably our best shot at protecting the buoy. So this is something, again, we, we can learn a lot from how, where to point our bow by looking at these temporal dynamics over time. Um, and then we get to the, a little bit, you know, the up the ante. So what about multiple benefits? Kristen mentioned, well, how, what are the trade-offs? How do we understand those? Uh, this is a, not a, a real data, but just a hypothetical to, to show some of the next steps in terms of decision making. Uh, this is three scenarios, each bar is a different scenario, and we might say, well, which one's the best one? 
Um, not actually a question we want to ask, but, <laughs> but it's actually a very logical thing to say, well, which one's the best one? Let's do that. But what it does help us understand is, is the, the longer the bar, the more it's meeting our objectives in terms of our desired outcomes across those pillars. And in this case, we just illustrate four different pillars. Water, fire, diversity, and, uh, and forest conditions. And you might say, if it's strictly based on overall per performance, the, the bottom one would, would do the best. And we'd say, oh, we have a, an objective of getting 70% or more of what we're hoping for, and it would meet that objective as well. But life isn't so simple, right? Um, and what this one does is it does a great job on water, but doesn't do quite so well on our fire and our diversity objectives. Uh, and then some of the other scenarios don't do as well overall, but they do better on some of these other factors. So where does that leave us? And I think really um, it means that we need to sort of think deeply about what our objectives are, how we measure success, and that as I mentioned earlier, those pillars are all interconnected. And so in essence, we're looking for a combination. We can learn from these different um, scenarios to really understand what combination of management approaches will float all these boats? That's the objective. You can't get landscape resilience by being really good at one of those and letting the rest fall to the side. So that's the challenge, but we have the data, we have the technology, um, and I think we have the political and social will to, to try to really sort this out to understand what those solution sets look like that get us um, further down the road. Um, so this last step is sort of how do you pull it all together? You've got all this information, right? You've got this resource assessment, you've got current conditions, you have an understanding of, uh, of future dynamics. Uh, from future conditions in the, in the green on the right, we understand what we have today, what are some of the limitations, what are some of the important assets we have in that landscape that, are, that we care about. And then for the potential future, we have an understanding of where might we expect fire, a lot of fire? Where might we expect things to be more stable? So earlier in the, uh, this morning, we talked about stable versus unstable carbon. Where can we find stable carbon, and how can we you know, foster that? So there's a lot we can learn from those dynamics. And then um, bringing that to, to bear on, well, so where, where's the potential for us to reach these benefits on this landscape? What areas have the best opportunity to meet certain benefits across those pillars, and which have don't? So you might say, well, where are areas where we can um, best manage fire? And we might have anchors for, for, for prescribed fire. And those probably aren't the best places where we want to manage for outpacks, for instance. Uh, so that's just an extreme example. But, <laughs> but you, might, you can say, well, certain places on this landscape are better at certain things than others. And we can know that. These, we can map that specifically. And some of the technology we have now, if you have LiDAR, that's great. That's a high-end ingredient. We're using Sylvia Terra, also a very good uh, 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 ingredient 15 meter resolution tree list data, and we get that's available throughout the entire Sierra Nevada every day. So um, those are things that you can actually sort of help us understand spatially, explicitly. What can you accomplish where? And so this box, this landscape box in, in white, is really the challenge. It's like we talked about. We have to adapt. We have to do things a little bit differently in individual. One is sort of how can we operate at these regional resilient landscape scales together in a collaborative way. Um, and, and how can we make decisions and set our course? Because uh, really the decision in terms of how much to treat, what kind of treatment, and is there a commitment to that? And then you can go to the blueprint, this roadmap, and say, okay, now where are we going to put those things and why? So um, the last slide I have, I think, is, um, gets to what um, I think we're all hoping for, right? This project design and implementation. <laughs> when do we get to uh, get out there and make a difference? Uh, and so this is the last piece, but I, I just want to sort of say that um, it's very tempting to jump to prioritization first, uh, but I think through the course of this uh, path that we've been on, it's becoming pretty clear that prioritization is the last thing you want to do. You want it to be highly informed by what are the benefits you're after, um, what are the trade-offs that folks are willing to make, what are the investments folks are willing to make, are able to make, so that opportunity, and then you can roll that up into, okay, based on that whole premise, where would we go and why? So this just is a quick example of how we can use tools, decision support tools. There are a variety of them out there. Um, this is a one that's an ecosystem management decision support tool, but there are, there are others that help us understand um, when you get down to these smaller scales. So this is the bottom up part where we've populated this landscape with all this data. Um, and you can do project planning based on that alone, or you can bring more data into it if you, if you have it available. Um, but Based on this alone, you can say, well, what are the, for this piece of the landscape, we have four pillars here, biodiversity, fire priority, um, forest resilience, and carbon. And for each of those, here are the priority areas we go to, to accomplish objectives for those individual outcomes. But we know we want to have multiple benefits. So using tools such as this, it helps.
helps us understand what are the things that are going into those pillars, those individual values, and the fire example is one where there's two metrics going into that. And then how do we sort of collapse those four and understand what this final treatment priority is and what is buying us in a quantitative manner in terms of each of those pillars. So we can quantitatively tell you what this last final treatment plan will buy you in terms of biodiversity, fire, risk reduction, forest resilience, and carbon, or other, those are just four examples of the, the outcomes. So we feel like this is a really exciting you know, path that we could, um, that others could follow in other places. All of these, this is a, it's a pretty robust recipe. The ingredients are available everywhere at various stripes. <laughs> and um, it's something that we're excited to share uh, with everyone. So thanks for that, and to everyone who's made this possible. Thank you very much, uh, Pat and Kristen. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Dan Porter. Dan Porter is the California Forest Project Director for the Nature Conservancy. He has a background in ecological research, research and applied forest management, and Dan manages the prescribed fire program for the Nature Conservancy. Dan also leads the forest, forestry engagement statewide, including property transactions, management partnerships, and development of state forest policies. Dan will walk us through some of the additional analyses that Pat and Kristen just presented on. Dan? Thank you, Dan. Well, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Dan Porter. I'm uh, the California Forest Project Director with the Nature Conservancy, and i um, been with the Conservancy for about 10 years, and I'm working um, hand in glove with uh, Pat and Kristen and a larger team on developing a series of science products uh, to help guide future management decisions for TCSI. So um, this this may strike you as a as a strange topic and juxtaposition forest resilience and small diameter wood products. Um, you know, the photo here is certainly not uh, representing small diameter uh, trees by any means. This is in fact a photo from the 1920s or 30s um, taken in connection with the Wieslander Vegetation Mapping Project, which is a fantastic ecological resource that really documented the natural heritage in California that was found um, at, at that point in history. It was a really important point for the Sierra Nevada because uh, it was a time that came after centuries of cultural fire use by Native American people and uh, was followed by an era of logging and fire suppression that put us in the condition that we're in now that we're all very aware of thanks to our speakers uh, that we've heard earlier today. But we really got into this space because uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, works um, on the ground. We try to do things, implement things, and then use that information to inform policies and practices. And one thing that we noticed as we were developing our forest management strategy is that um, you know, while we were eagerly applying all the tools in the toolbox, increasing the, the pace and use of prescribed fire, increasing the use of managed wildfire, increasing the use of ecological thinning to safely prepare the landscape to accept more good fire, uh, we are bumping up against this obstacle that uh, we really didn't expect to find, and that was uh, once we thinned the material out of the forest, which was uh, small trees, very, very little value, as Kristen has detailed, uh, we were having a hard time figuring out who to sell it to and get someone to actually take the material. Um, Sierra Nevada is, is a steep area, all the main roads go north-south, the mountains go east-west, um, transportation distances are immense, and the value of the material is very small. So we started to round out our overall conservation strategy for uh, forest, for managing California's fire-adapted forests to include these bottom elements of, of wood processing, um, sort of an unusual space for us to occupy, um, specifically bioenergy, uh, sawmills, and uh, centers of innovation that can take uh, low value wood products and turn them into higher value products. This is a space that we knew very little about up until 
uh, about a year ago uh, when we undertook two related studies. One was done by a, a group of business consultants uh, from Bain and Company who really looked at the um, end markets uh, for wood products that are sourced from small diameter uh, trees. And the other one is the wood supply analysis for the TCSI area. I'll cover both uh, at a pretty high level um, and, and hopefully draw some of the findings together at the end. Uh, the other critical piece of this whole strategy, of course, which has been touched on a number of times, are the people. Um, there's a workforce element to this. There is a um, skills element to this that is vitally important to our success, and we are um, woefully behind the curve on, on that particular piece, so we want to highlight the importance of that. Um, just some examples and, and acknowledgement to our many partners in terms of how the Conservancy tries to get things done on the ground. Um, these are some of our engagements and, and partners. And, and the way we approach these is to, uh, in a very practical manner, uh, we try to find environmental solutions that are broadly applicable and re replicable so others can take up our work and apply them elsewhere. Some examples are um, our work with Placer County and Placer County Water Agency. Uh, both have a vested interest in water quality associated with the higher amount reservoirs. Both have a vested interest in not seeing uh, high severity fires damage the forest and therefore damage the infrastructure that provides that clean water. In the exact same place, the American River, the Nature Conservancy has a vested interest in seeing the freshwater biological diversity there preserved and also not damaged by severe wildfires. So we've been partnering with those two entities and many others on the top part of this panel to really accelerate the pace of restoration through ecological thinning and increased use of uh, prescribed fire. We're also working with the Forest Service on those projects as well as on the Tahoe National Forest on a uh, managed wildfire amendment. And this is essentially um, the beneficial use of fire, wildfire, when naturally ignited, allowed to burn uh, within safe borders uh, where there's minimal risk to people. Uh, to really do some of the, the work, the good work of fuels reduction for us uh, in a thoughtful way. Um, so Ed Smith and, and others are working on that uh, on behalf of our team. I'll go through this pretty quickly because I think the case for change has been made pretty clearly by uh, previous speakers. Uh, this is a snapshot of, of the King Fire, high, high severity patch of the King Fire. And um, the resulting uh, damages are just coming into view. Um, so recent scientific studies are looking at uh, impacts to old forest dependent species like the North, northern goshawk, California spotted owl because of high severity fire. And a related set of studies are actually establishing a relationship between fire diversity, in other words, low, moderate, high severity with biodiversity. So forest bats, for example, which are a top forest predator, uh, actually seem to thrive on a range of fire types across this landscape. So all the more reason to try to rebalance the situation. Um, on the left, of course, high severity fires move a lot of dirt afterward. Roads fail, bridges fail, that really adds to the deferred maintenance costs or maintenance costs of the various reservoirs, which then get translated oftentimes into people's bills. Um, the case for preventative work is, is solid. Several years ago, my colleague David Edelson and Kristen Wilson put together a, a avoided cost study on the Macaulay River watershed and showed that the cost savings associated with preventive fuels work is absolutely outstanding. So I encourage you to pick up that report and see what those cost savings are. Um, so all this work <clears throat> lands in the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative area, and the Nature Conservancy's work in particular is informed by principles of ecological forestry, and this is also available online. Um, our view of ecological forestry is uh, small trees, removing them from below, um, with an eye towards recruiting, retaining those very large fire resilient trees over time and restoring the natural process of the forest. So we're talking about thinning, prescribed fire um, on intervals that, as Kristen mentioned, uh, match uh, the historic period as closely as possible. So moving to um, the study with Bain and Company, the business consultants, um, I mentioned that we ran into this problem. We didn't know where to sell our logs and we had to really take several extra steps for our French Meadows project to actually 
um, get some you know small to medium sized logs uh, purchased, which in fact reduces our overall restoration cost, which is a good thing. Um, and we wondered why is that, and we heard a lot of different things, uh, researched it for a bit for ourselves, but quickly came to the conclusion that um, markets is not something the Nature Conservancy understands particularly well, but fortunately we have this partnership with painting company who really do understand markets and how they develop and how they're launched, and so they worked with us for about four months to uh, actually evaluate 40 different end markets uh, for wood products that are sourced from small diameter trees. And the goal of the overall effort was to inform the Nature Conservancy's view on which of those end markets might be a appropriate uh, off-taker of small diameter trees to help move this whole pipeline of projects along that others have described. Because without this step in the overall pipeline, all the other steps could potentially come to a rather dramatic halt. So we don't want that to happen. So I'll jump into the key findings uh, that Bain came up with first, and then I'll, I'll sort of backtrack in terms of how they got there. Interestingly, we sort of came full circle. You'd think out of 40 um, wood products, there'd be something out there that was really new, a silver bullet. Um, that may be true, technology uh, evolved very quickly, and our lens for uh, efficacy was really a 10-year period. We are looking at a very short-term implementation window. And with that lens and some other filters, which I'll get into in a bit, their, their key findings were really that um, the three most promising uh, off-taking models for small diameter trees are the ones that largely exist out there today. Bioenergy, sawmills, but with an emphasis on highly efficient small log mills, and uh, this concept of an integrated campus where we're pairing both bioenergy, small log mills, and have as an anchor tenant uh, center for innovation for, for novel products that are more in the R&D phase. Um, the main advantages of, of biomass, it has a lot of detractors. There's a lot of um, reasons to be uh, concerned about you know, the air quality uh, emissions, um, particularly of the larger plants. But the, the advantage of it is it, it can take on a broad variety of tree sizes, tree species, and um, dead trees, live trees. Um, and the air quality uh, containment uh, technologies have improved quite a bit. Um, it's actually one of the only markets that's actually large enough to remove enough fuel from the forest to move the needle on fire behavior is, is one of the main conclusions. And the economics on developing or redeveloping one of these plants are not bad. The payback period can be relatively short, six to 10 years, but that assumes uh, good operating economics, which we heard earlier, if you were here, that those can be quite challenging and might need a substantial subsidy of one kind or the other. Um, on sawmills, um, a similar story, although uh, much more positive in with respect to the end price of the product, so that then reduces the restoration costs a bit more. Um, and then the carbon sequestration potential for durable wood products is of course much better than burning wood chips uh, in a biomass plant. So some advantages there. The risks, of course, are that um, the margins on any sawmilling uh, operation are, are razor thin. So execution risk is, is a big deal. You need a really good operator who knows what they're doing, buys the right equipment, uh, secures a really good uh, stable supply of small diameter trees over a 10 to 20 year period, and can weather the volatility in housing starts, which is really what affects uh, the, the prices in California. And the integrated campus is a, a similar story, but it's a, a but and story where the bioenergy plant actually produces power for the sawmill, which is a cost savings, and then the sawmill is actually throwing off mill residues, which the bioenergy plant is using. So they're complementing each other in that regard, and uh, therefore uh, the whole operation tends to be a lot more efficient. Um, I said I'd go back and, and explain how they came to these. We, we developed with them these three filters across the top. Um, for any end market. Uh, the first one was feasibility. Does 
the technology exists and the infrastructure exists to uh, u utilize small diameter timber in the first place in this market. So that's a pretty clear yes or no answer. Um, on the environmental impact, uh, I mentioned this earlier, is the market size big enough to actually move enough material to, to significantly effectuate fire behavior in the Sierra Nevada? And if not, we move on to other markets. The other important piece of this, of course, is uh, are there unintended consequences associated with spurring any one market? You can quickly get into a uh, feed the beast situation if you overbuild infrastructure, which is not what any of us want. So it's we're really talking about you know tailoring this to uh, the, the problem at hand. And then of course economic viability. There has to be a, an actual viable path uh, that accommodates risk and return considerations that would attract investors to this. Um, in the first place. So of those 40, um, they then ranked uh, those markets into four categories, those with high potential, those that are nascent, just too young really to have any bearing in the next 10 years, uh, ancillary markets, which are pretty small but could boost a little bit of revenue and therefore reduce our restoration costs, and then those that were just deprioritized for any variety of reasons, technical or um, economically challenged sectors. And then the general results here on, on the overall market categories are on the right. Um, there were 16 deprioritized, nine sort of rose to the top. And then we further screened those for considerations like what is it like to do business in California, other technical factors having to do with the species we have, and the nine quickly went down to the three that I shared earlier. So to contextualize all that uh, to California, i just share a bit of information here that many of you may already know or not. Um, the, the milling infrastructure in California today is really matched to the private land base that's out there, plus a little bit more. Um, there are basically no idle sawmills in, in California. And the ones that are operating are um, operating at a high uh, percentage of their of their op productive capacity. So on the right, um, between 2000 and 2016, uh, this report shows that the, the sawmills in California are operating at between 80 and 88 percent capacity. So that's that's pretty much the top end for any um, mill uh, in the Sierra Nevada. So we took all this information and, and we thought, okay, what are we going to do about the top of Central Sierra initiative? This is an area that as others have said, we want to do things differently. We want to accelerate restoration. Um, but how do we do that if we see this bottleneck coming up? So what we did was we, we launched a phase one wood supply analysis that is related to but different than the assessment that Pat and Kristen referred to. It's different in that it doesn't have all the great variables around drought um, susceptibility or fire behavior or anything like this. This is a bare bones, first cut approximation at if your goal is to thin small trees in areas that are uh, operable, easy to access, um, where would you do that under different scenarios and how much small diameter wood would that spin off? And what are the implications for that in terms of um, the, the infrastructure that's there and the infrastructure that we need? So um, I'll go through this pretty quickly. You know the landscape. We divided it into seven management zones. Uh, these are pretty similar to what Kristen shared before. The, the red and the pink are the defense and threat zones around uh, major roads, towns, things like that. Um, and then we developed ecologically-based thinning prescriptions uh, using a combination of the management zone, the landowner, private, public, and the sero stage, or the age of the forest, essentially. We modeled uh, the prescriptions and the growth and the mortality for 20 years, assuming a maximum of one entry uh, in each stand in that 20 years, and then prioritized the treatments based on a measure called STI, or stand density index, which is a basic metric of how many small trees you have in an area. Then we took those designations and those prescriptions, and we ran them through four scenarios. So these are different scenarios than Kristen and Pat covered. Like I said, this is a bare bones sort of operational model just to get a first sense of what we're looking at. 
Um, scenario one was trying to capture the last five years of management, that level of activity, um, so we call that business as usual. Scenario two really focused on all the treatments um, in the red and the pink area. So protecting those ingress, egress uh, zones, protecting communities. So we call it the community protection focus. Scenario three is the forest health focus. So it adds to scenario one and two, and then uh, starts to get into the green, the light green general forest. And in the background, we've got all lands, private forestry happening as it, as it has for the last several years. And then scenario four is the most ambitious uh, restoration scenario where we're adding to scenario one, two, three, and then we're going even further out uh, into the, the general forest, not treating in wilderness, not treating in um, roadless areas, and we're also really not treating any steep slopes. So we use the, the assumptions of Malcolm North's 2012 paper where operability is really constrained to the upper slope. So this is a pretty conservative estimate of what could be done given the current technologies. Um, on the prescriptions themselves, uh, you can see we varied the prescriptions based on the zone. So the, the take home here is that in the defense zone closest into the homes, we have the widest variety of, of interventions, except for the use of prescribed fire for obvious reasons. Same for the threat zone. Then when we get into the US Forest Service land, we tend to constrain the number of uh, uh, thinning options and really rely more on the use of prescribed fire. Um, so these are tailored in a spatially explicit way. Um, in retrospect, uh, I think I redo this slide, so I'm gonna, because it's very complicated. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna try to walk you through it anyway. Um, what I want you to focus on is, um, imagine first that the TCSI area is in the dark green area on that map because that's exactly where it is. And <laughs> second, I want you to imagine that there are several biomass and, and sawmills located around the periphery of that dark green area. And those sawmills are now taking wood in a variety of sizes from inside the TCSI area and outside the TCSI area. And so what our um, very capable consultants at Mason Bruce Gerard did was they they tallied by these different scenarios what the biomass volumes would be and the saw timber volumes would be uh, coming out of TCSI exclusively. And then compare that to what they know to be the processing capacity with the existing biomass plants and sawmills there. And so down here in, in these orange numbers, this harvest percent of uh, the buffer, that is really, the closer you are to 100%, the closer you are to maxing out the regional processing capacity that's there today. So you can see for saw timber, right now, we look like we're a little bit below uh, for scenarios one and two, but if we up the pace and scale, we'll quickly get up to 88% of the current capacity. And that doesn't account for the fact that there's still wood coming into those mills from outside TCSI. So getting into scenario three and four is going to have all kinds of strange ripple effects in terms of where, good, where, where wood goes, who buys what, what the pricing is, and everything else. There's all kinds of potential dysfunction there that we absolutely um, want to avoid. The biomass picture is a little bit easier to interpret. You can see that the buffer numbers are all negative, and all the percentages are over 100%. That means that for any scenario that we run right now, we're already in excess of, of capacity to, to process biomass, which is all material 10 inches and less, and saw timbers anything 10 inches and, and larger. So what this suggests is that if what we want to do is really increase the pace and scale of ecologically based forest restoration, we need uh, appropriately sized processing centers to handle the byproduct of the forest restoration treatments that are closer into the source of the wood supply itself to minimize transportation distance and reduce the overall cost of restoration. Now, how we get there is the work that we're going through right now. We're considering a range of public policy interventions 
um, that will hopefully roll out in the next uh, you know six four to six months. But this is where we're at now, um, and happy to take any questions in the in the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, turn to a presentation on the North Cuba by Becky Estes. Becky Estes is the Central Sierra Province Ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service. An expert in vegetation and fire ecology in Mediterranean climates, Becky has worked with the El Dorado, Tahoe, uh, Stanislaus National Forest, and as well as the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit. Her recent research focuses on managing post-fire landscapes to ensure future resilience in the face of a changing climate. Becky will be presenting on an analysis of the North Yuba watershed that builds off of the work presented earlier in these presentations, but that has evolved through a separate collaborative process. Known as the North Yuba Forest Partnership, it is located in the TCSI area, and they are working to collaboratively plan, analyze, finance, and implement forest restoration across the entire 275,000-acre North Yuba watershed. Becky will present on the foundational planning tools she and her colleagues have been building to support this effort. Becky, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you for the introduction. I do notice that there's a number of people here from the North Cuba Partnership. Um, and I also want to point out that we have a core team, let me pop the slide there, that's been working on this project. Um, quite a bit that involves people from the Tahoe National Forest as well as the partnership. And so it's been a, a long process, but I think really amazing that we're getting to the point where we're um, starting to get results and we're starting to apply them on the ground. Um, one thing I will point out, so I work with the Region 5 Ecology Group with Hugh Safford's group. Hopefully my talk will be a little um, more uplifting. We'll see. <laughs> Stand by. But um, I often put my manager's hat on to think about how we can translate uh, complicated um, scientific, scientific information into usable management objectives. And Kevin McGarrigle, who's on the slide right here, is the principal investigator on this project, and he is an absolute genius at um, really translating information that's complex modeling outputs to um, real-world on-the-ground application. So before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about um, just background information for those of you that are unfamiliar with um, natural range variability or the range variability concept. If you can think back to your statistics days, if you ever took a class in statistics way back when, I know for me that was a long time ago, although I continue to take them to this day, you probably heard something about the mean mentioned and the range variability. And so if we think about ecosystems and landscapes, they're in a constant state of change. So if you can see here on the screen, um, we've got an ecosystem variable. I think I've heard stand density mentioned a couple of times this morning. Well, if you can think about stand density um, throughout a historical range um, period, it likely varied over and around and up and down that mean line. And so it creates these dotted lines, um, which is your range of variability. And so we can really measure that um, in those systems uh, when we have certain processes that happen. And so natural range variability is essentially an ecological condition, so we can measure it across space and time, um, and it's usually unaffected by people, and um, it has like an expressed goal, something, and you'll hear a lot about this in this talk, about the goals that we have in this process and how we're using NRV um, to accomplish them. So there's a couple of variations on this theme. If you've heard anything about resilience, I'm sure the natural range of variability has come up. So there's also, also this term historical range of variability that are often used synonymously. However, there is a big difference between these two things. The historical range measures the natural variability in the past, whereas natural range of variability measures um, variability unaffected by people. So I think earlier someone mentioned uh, the Illouette Basin, which is in Yosemite National Park. Um, it's often used as a reference site. And so this area we know has likely been affected by people at some point, but the natural processes are largely still in place. Um, and then we also talked a little this morning, or this afternoon earlier, about the social range of variability. So despite the fact that we may understand the natural range of variability of the ecological range, 
there's still this idea of social range of variability, and that's really what people find acceptable. And so that's sort of the next stage in this process, and I think that's a lot of the work that TCSI um, will accomplish, um, as well as this future range of variability. So you heard Kristen talk a little bit about some of the climate scenarios, um, and so that's really important too to understand as well. So why HRV? So being the Forest Service, um, obviously it's important to note that this is part of our 2012 um, Forest Service planning rule. So it's a very important um, aspect of understanding how our forests um, have evolved over time and really understanding that range of variability and capitalizing on that. Um, it also ensures optimal diversity. Um, it reflects nicely the role of disturbance in landscape dynamics. Um, and it also, because it provides a range, it widens our options for management. And hopefully it maintains a, a resilient landscape. And we've talked a lot about resilience today. So how do we measure HRV? Um, well, uh, back in, I think, 2012, when we went through the biosystem, uh, bioregional planning effort, um, in the sort of beginning phases of forest planning throughout the Sierra Nevada, uh, we looked at uh, basically summarizing all the literature out there that talks about the natural range variability. So summarizing all the spatial and temporal conditions of ecosystem structure, of its function, composition, um, and connectivity. And so you can see here, there's uh, two documents, two general technical reports that came out of this um, so far. We did cover all vegetation types. So this is just one way that you can measure um, NRV in your landscape. The other way, and the way we're doing it here, which is, of course, a much more complicated way, is to use simulation modeling. So essentially models that tell us how the landscape has changed with regards to disturbance and succession. And so there's a number of reasons why using a modeling approach is um, pretty, a pretty good way to take. Um, it ensures spatial consistency. I think, for me, that's probably the most important piece of this, is, is that it's giving us spatial effects. So we're not just understanding changes across time, but we can also pinpoint those changes on the landscape. Um, it also allows um, or expands our um, inconsistent data that we may have, and then it integrates the so now we want to move into talking about the case study that was mentioned. So there's a lot of work that's been going on in the North Cuba Partnership, and it's pretty amazing work um, playing on a fairly large landscape. And so the hope is that a lot of this NRV, or HRV work, excuse me, that um, we produce from this modeling effort will provide just one sort of leg to that stool um, in understanding how we're going to plan for such a large landscape. Um, so the first objective is to quantify the HRV and current departure in the landscape, and I think it's important to note, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, that we really capitalize on having those high-resolution data sets available, so LIDAR data sets um, specifically. And then the second piece, and this is the piece that's ongoing, and if you ever want to come to a core team meeting on the North Hebrew Project, this is where we're hashing out all the details and really getting down to where the rubber meets the road on how do we use all these complicated metrics and how is it going to help us plan at a large landscape scale. And the important thing to note here in this bottom bullet is that our attempt here is to try and make this applicable at the project level. And so here's an idea of the project area, and I should have thrown um, the TCSI boundary in here, but I think you guys have seen that so you can kind of understand where TC TCSI fits here. So the um, black line is the Upper Yuba River watershed, um, and so that's the focus of this project and where the partnership is focused as well. The green line is the North Sierra, and that encompasses the area where a lot of the um, quantitative data was gathered for this project. And then TCI sort of encompasses all of the North Yuba, all of that black line, and then to the south and to the east. And so, as I mentioned, it's a fairly large area um, that we're attempting planning on, uh, 358,000 acres. So I just want to talk a little bit about spatial data inputs. I'm not going to bore you with the details. I just want to capitalize on, um, on highlighting uh, the use of using some of these more novel, high spatial resolution data sets. So one example is cover, and currently we don't really have good high resolution data for this. Um, but there are attempts, I think, moving forward um, to obtain this on a more regional level. 
So tree cover, so this is, was derived from the LiDAR data set, and this is where I really think that this effort um, gets to a project level um, basis, helping us understand how we can plan prescriptions. And that's largely because we're looking at data that's at a five meter resolution. So we're looking at really small areas. So you can see here you know, the entire landscape, and it's basically you know, broken up into isolated trees where we have one individual tree and then dense clumps of trees. So trees where we have greater than 60% canopy cover. So you can see it's really hard to, to see sort of the fine grain until you zoom into that upper right hand corner. And then you really start to see that there's a lot of patterns going on, and this is just our current condition. So likewise, we had another data set that was derived from the high resolution data, age data. And so you can see up in the right hand corner, age ranges from zero to 400. And so we have quite a range of ages, um, even in our current condition across the landscape. So this really, I think, helps um, provide sort of an understanding of how some of this information can then be used um, in our reference conditions. So just to talk about the modeling effort just briefly, um, if you look at the map on the right, so this is essentially a, a screen capture of fires that occur in the landscape, so in red. So one thing that you can note already is that a model such as this is spatially explicit. So we you know, know where those fires are occurring across the landscape. Um, and it's basically, it encompasses data that we know um, is statistically relevant. So it's empirical data that's been scientifically um, you know, peer-reviewed, peer and so we know that it's a reliable resource of information. And so to run the model, essentially we're just looking at uh, a historical reference period of 1550 to 1850, and so this is the idea of trying to understand what vegetation conditions looked like during that time period before European settlement, so pre-European. And the model is essentially run for a number of time steps, and it comes to an equilibrium, you can see, at about 100 years. And so that's the information that then we summarize. So this is where you get, um, you know, really, you can get deep into the weeds in the modeling. So some of the key model processes, I think we all are very aware, I think this morning when it was asked how many people live in the Sierra Nevada or recreates in the Sierra Nevada, it's a lot of us. So we understand that disturbance is a major process here. Um, it modifies vegetation, um, it changes um, vegetation over time, it transitions vegetation over time, and so disturbance is a key factor in this modeling process. Um, we looked at you know, where fires start, how they spread, um, when they end, um, their mortality, how they affect the vegetation, and then whether or not they can change the vegetation type. And then the second key process is succession, and this is equally as important. If anybody's ever been in an area after a fire, you know that it takes time for vegetation to come back. And so we're really interested in understanding um, what those transitions are. Um, that was specifically be, um, from beetle or a drought. And so one thing that I thought was really important, and um, I had mentioned Scott Conway's in the room, and he was a pretty pivotal in, in helping develop this framework. And Pat um, and Kristen talked a little bit about using sort of climate um, units to help define the landscape. And so we're taking a fairly similar approach here using biophysical units. And so essentially we're looking at vegetation and we're really trying to think about where uh, within those vegetation types you might have a gradient from xeric to mesic. So areas where your vegetation might be more vulnerable um, due to site conditions or where it might be uh, less vulnerable because there's more water available. And so we saw that there were sort of two benefits to using this framework. Um, the first one is that we can look at this um, at a, from a monitoring perspective, so at a more landscape scale. And so you see in the underlying map here, we just um, those BPUs. So we're just looking now. monitor um, within that area. So the really important part of the BPUs is that they're each broken up into individual sites. So within that BPU, we have 1,200 individual sites. And so for each one of those, 
we can look at um, project level prescriptions. So we can really start to think about how reference conditions, how HRV would have looked like in that historic period, and how that might help us guide um, our landscape scale and project level planning. So now I just want to talk about some of the metrics. And so um, we're in the process of pulling all of this information together. Um, Kevin came out a couple of weeks ago. We had an uh, excellent workshop where we really um, started to drill down to those metrics that we felt like were important for um, not only planning the landscape, but also for managing. And so these are the ones we've um, I pulled out. We're not going to talk about all of them today. I'm just going to highlight a few that I think are really um, important to think about. Um, but all of these metrics are represented, well, we can think about composition, so basically how much is there on the landscape, and then configuration, how is it arranged. And so from here on, the results that I'm presenting here are reference conditions. So this is after the model run, we get a lot of model outputs, and we, as the core team, have really worked at trying to coalesce those, the, that output into these few metrics. And so the first metric I want to talk about is the mean fire return interval. And so if you look here, um, one of the things that we, we've talked about as a core group is understanding um, persistence across the landscape. And so if you think about fire and where fire would have occurred historically, and a, a, a lot of, like, I've spent a lot of time in the, um, the Klamath National Forest and looking at fires there and fires that have occurred. And a lot of the times we start to see patterns where fires are reinforcing each other, they tend to burn at high severity in specific locations, and so it's this whole idea of persistence. Like maybe there's just certain places on the landscape that are persistent. And so we can really use the fire return interval um, output to help us understand that. So some of these areas that might be um, burning at a low um, mean return interval, so a short amount of time between fires might be on ridges. You know, maybe that's large And so this is just an example of looking at this from, uh, and so one of the things that we can start to think about is at that smaller scale, at that unit scale, we can actually provide ranges. So we can look at here, um, a fire would have occurred every 21 to 72 years historically. And so we can think about that as sort of a guiding um, principle uh, when we start, start planning. So another one is developmental stage, and this, as you can see, so this is our reference condition. So this was derived initially from our current condition LIDAR data, and you can see that there is a lot of heterogeneity on that landscape. We've got open areas, we've got tall trees, um, it's, it's highly variable. And I'll just give you a quick pictorial on what we mean when we say developmental stage. So it ranges anywhere from open to tall trees. And so with this information here, we really start to understand that things were a shifting mosaic. But when we drill down to sort of that unit level again, we can generate information that looks at that. Oh, this, oops, thought it was on that one. Um, we can look at um, the open conditions all the way to the tall trees. And we can think about, in the red dotted line, that's our current condition. So we can start to identify areas of departure. So I think this one is the, the coolest metric that we're um, producing from this output. And this is the tall tree stands. And a lot of this discussion revolves around um, some of the work that was done by Malcolm North et al., and as well as folks at the University of Wisconsin looking at the cover of tall trees. And we're really interested in trying to understand what that looked like spatially across the landscape. And so what we've done is generate these tall tree stand probabilities. So this is reference so you can really start to think about where you have low probability of tall trees versus where you have high probability of tall trees. And for example, some of those areas in green, those might be areas where you want to prioritize for maintaining the tall trees that are existing there because you have a high likelihood of them um, surviving. Tree cover is another example of a metric um, that we can derive from this work. And essentially that gives us an idea of what cover looked like historically. And so we can start to think about as we treat at a landscape or at a unit level um, what we would want to maintain or recreate. So this is just an example of what that looks like um, when we think about isolated trees, so an individual tree all the way to um, dense 
a dense forest stand. So we all know, I think I've heard the King Fire mentioned a couple of times, so we're all very familiar with what large forest openings look like after a high severity fire, where regeneration um, doesn't happen very quickly. And so that's one metric that we were interested in understanding um, across this landscape and the reference conditions. So here's an example of forest openings. So we've got large forest openings, that's the purple, and then the orange are the smaller forest openings. And the one thing to note that this is a very small scale. So this is um, you know, five tiny little pixels in a very small area. So those large openings are not very large. And I have a quick example of that right here, looking at large forest openings. And so you can see in the black, that's current conditions, and the red is the simulated, the reference conditions for large forest openings. And you can see that, for the most part, our patch sizes and reference conditions were very small. So we had a lot of really small patches. And so one thing that um, we've been thinking about in the core team is understanding if we look at a unit and we have no patches, then we can think about reference conditions and say, well, maybe we want to recreate um, so many openings within that landscape. And so that's about all I have. One thing that I did want to mention just in summary of this. So we do have plans on having final reports um, available, and so essentially it's going to be a landscape design plan for the North Yuba that then the partnership will be able to work with and will get to work in conjunction with the partnership um, to help you know, develop large landscape scale planning. And so I really think that this is sort of a proven quantitative approach here that demonstrates the feasibility of creating detailed, specific, and quantitative information that can guide landscape restoration. And I will just note four things. I think it helps in prioritizing the landscape, so you can really identify areas of high value. Um, it identifies need for change by establishing the departure in current conditions. It provides this fine scale spatial data that can help guide project level planning. And it establishes a baseline to evaluate changes in landscapes over the long term. So it's a perfect monitoring tool as well. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, we are going to get the screen up and then ask our presenters to come back up so that we can have a uh, Q&A session uh, with the audience. For the Q&A session, um, I'm going to ask a, start, uh, a starting question for the group, and then we'll move it to the audience. We're going to have two mic runners, one on either side, so you know, please raise your hand and let them know that you have a question, and we'll get, go on ahead and get them staged after we, uh, we go through uh, the first question. So to start things off, um, I wanted to ask each of our panelists uh, to respond to the following question. Each of you walked us through a process specifically designed to meet the preferences and goals of the collaboratives you are currently working with. Are the tools you presented on one-offs for those areas, or are there opportunities to leverage these tools in other areas, and if so, uh, how could they help, help the state meet its resilience goals? So why don't we start with you, Pat, and then just go down the line. Sure. Um, so I think that, um, you know, what we've, uh, across the board, I think, is it not on? No. It's not on. It's not on. Is this one on? There's a light on. Is that on? No. All right. No, they're all green. They're all just green. Okay, well, um, I'll make believe and speak loudly. Because <laughs> I know we don't have much time. Uh, so, you know, I think that the, the, the great thing about, I think, across the board, what you heard today is, is that um, these explorations are providing kind of a pathway to understanding 
how we can get the information that we that we well first of all what information we really think is pertinent about these landscapes at various scales and I feel like we're you know across the board these 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 endeavors are really helping to clarify that and then where can we go to get that information and how can we analyze it and bring it to light and, and understand it and I think there's also some paths that have been that are being um, you know forged toward that end and then I think in any of these larger landscapes um, and even at the project scale but I think these larger landscapes help set the stage for what is it you might want where can you get it what sort of investments would we need to be made across the board not just in you know um, uh, treatments but also where does that material go how does it get processed and how does you sort of um, work that loop of that that that, that um, continuum between ecological conditions and, and, and community well-being, and I think that that's where it's starting to get to. Is like, wait, there's a formula there that can be uh, really quantified, and then resources uh, you know acquired in order to make those investments across the board. And I feel like that's something that can be done um, a anywhere throughout the Sierra Nevada, and truly uh, other elsewhere in the state. It's really an approach that is very exciting, and I think that we've. Um, all of these investments are helping to show how one can get there. Yeah, I think, um, I, I probably mentioned this, but the HRV work will be expanded to TCSI landscape. I'm sure I made that very clear. And so I think there's really amazing opportunities with all of the information that's coming out of TCSI to really help think about um, what, what, is, what works, like, particularly with our collaborative groups. Um, they're very interested in landscape scale planning, they're very interested in understanding what's happening um, to specific vegetation types, and so really capitalizing on all this information I think will be very useful. And I think as far as applicability, particularly outside of TCSI, I think that, yeah, I think that all of these um, processes, all these projects that have been talked about are very relevant, and I think um, I've already had conversations with people on the Stanislaus that are interested in the work that TCSI is doing and wanting to know how or if there was um, you know, opportunities for them to capitalize on similar pieces of information. Just to echo what Pat was saying, uh, the benefit I think is defining what resilience means and figuring out how to quantify it and compare your current conditions and possible future conditions to it. So I think the value um, is gonna be really easy to see when we're done with this product and it, it can be useful for other groups that want to try and reach resilience across the Sierra Nevada. I'll speak to the, the wood supply analysis. Um, definitely uh, the method that I presented is replicable and, uh, and if it's replicated can certainly help uh, move us towards achieving our statewide goals. I think it's been mentioned a couple times that uh, collectively we've set a goal to treat uh, about a million acres a year. We're really far from that goal. Um, but the good news is um, everything that we used is widely available. The Sylvia Terra data, that was the underlying data, is wall to wall for the entire uh, and can be transportation networks are all provide a really comprehensive look at both wood supply, restoration wood supply, and uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask the audience, we have a lot of in-region partners out in the audience, and we have a lot of people who are involved in the policy discussions here at the Capitol. It's a lot of knowledge and experience here. And I wanted to get your initial thoughts and feedback and suggestions and comments. If you would like to talk about you know, how these tools could help with your resilience efforts and resilience goals and, and helping you define and move that process forward in your area. You know, does anyone want to uh, have a comment or a question on that? Yeah, please. Yeah, we'll pass the mic to you. And if you would, um, could you please state your name, affiliation, and let us uh, know if you're an in-region partner and in your policy lead? That's a lot of questions. It is. <laughs> I didn't think that through well enough. Name and affiliation will okay, do. That works. I'm Rosemary Smallcomb. I'm a Barapulsa County Supervisor. And I also am new to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board and happy to be there. What I'm wondering about is, and I love data, I love hearing about all of the data that you I believe 
that it's important that we make decisions at the local and experience that you have or any thoughts as to how it may play out is the the resilience of different uh, systems, I guess, or subsystems within the larger system, and how do you have that conversation at the local level in a way that's meaningful and can actually support uh, decision making that does, in fact, uh, promote long term resilience? Does that make sense? <laughs> So how does the local scale relate to the bigger framing of resilience is the question, right? How do you actually take what we've done at this 2.4 million acre scale that we're doing right now and use it for their, your local scale values and um, priorities, right? I think um, when we get to the point where we've analyzed current conditions and future conditions and we've defined resilience, then it's up to the local groups to uh, figure out, you know, which of those outcomes is meaning um, fire risk reduction, uh, emissions reduction, um, timber supply, you know, reduction of drought vulnerability, all these things that we're quantifying from uh, management scenarios, uh, which of those really resonate with you for your local community and, and where does the priority need to be? Because we can define resilient forest conditions, but those outcomes, I think, will probably shape your local decisions, like which ones are, um, yeah, which ones are more important for your local area, I think is, important, is a consideration. I'll just, I'll just add to that. I think um, that, uh, you know, th this large landscape scale that we were talking about before, this sort of multi-million acre scale, really helps sets the stage in terms of um, what those outcomes look like and how, how one can get there. So um, some of these resilience outcomes are things that you really, can't, like I we mentioned earlier, really can't measure them all that effectively at smaller scales. So for instance, you know, water implications for downstream use. That's not something you can really evaluate at a, at a, at a, you know, a, a small watershed scale per se. You can, you can know what the difference is between if you do A or B, but you actually don't know what the bigger consequences, the cumulative effects of, of actions across that landscape. So I think that that's where that sets that stage in terms of saying, what sort of outcomes do we really think are possible in this landscape? How do they comport with one another? Are there trade-offs we need to make and why? Um, uh, and then I think, just as Kristen was saying, at the smaller scales, you can kind of understand, let's say, if there's a limiting factor, a limiting condition in that landscape, and um, I'll just, uh, um, well, I'll use old forest because that's easy for me to think about. <laughs> but if you say, well, oh, we just don't have enough, we, we, based on this historical information and based on what we understand to be conditions that will promote uh, resilience across multiple outcomes, we might want to move this landscape to having a, a more old forest conditions. And then that might say, well, across the landscape, where are those places that are already contributing to that? And perhaps because that's a limiting factor at that large scale in order to meet that balance of objectives, that those sites might actually have priority for that condition until it becomes less limiting, in which case there are more options. So the spatially explicit prioritization of benefits at the large scale could and probably should inform um, priorities at the, at the more localized scale, but they don't dominate it, and they certainly don't prescribe it. It's just a set of sort of a understanding kind of how these scales work together. Now that does help quite a bit. It means it's a large scale conversation, which from my perspective makes it more challenging, but more beneficial in the long run. So thank you. Hi, um, my name is Bernadette Beasy. I am a, a National Ecosystems Technical Leader for Stantec, but more importantly, I'm based in Nevada City. And so my question to you was, um, could you speak a little bit about how the wilderness areas and the roadless areas informed your models? You spoke how there are lower priorities, or as you look at management scenarios, obviously not managing those areas. And how do they feed into the inner models? Uh, are they you know, management? Are they reference sites? Uh, could you speak a little bit to that? So I can talk to you, uh, we can uh, I'll describe what we did for the for the TCFI landscape overall. And um, 
certainly in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, managing forests or managing disturbance in forests to, to create conditions that are resilient to a whole range of disturbances, fire, climate change and stuff, the wilderness in essence is no different than any other land designation in, in a sense. It provides a whole lot of a range of benefits and, and um, because of uh, uh, a variety of things that, that people need to do to, to reduce the risk of some types of disturbance, we have to fill in with other disturbance. So in, in the TCSI um, approach, the treatments in wild or uh, in wilderness was a function of wildfire, because that's the kind of treatment that can be done. And any fire that occurred in that landscape that had these beneficial effects contributed to the disturbance return interval, creating conditions of value or, or a desired conditions. So um, whether they were human induced through prescribed fire or they were naturally induced through ignitions of other from other sources that that those were all actions that were sort of you, you round up in terms of saying, well, you know, where are we? Are we within our desired range of, of frequency of disturbance and the kind of disturbance? And are we creating conditions that we feel are going to be resilient to, to future distressors? So in essence, it didn't really get treated any differently than the general forest, other than the kind of treatment that we would put in to fill in would be a different type. Yeah, especially when we any differently from the wilderness or from private land in holdings or considerations that when we get down into that. I'm with the Center for the Force Majeure. I have a question that's mostly really interesting. Center Sure, sure, happy to. Um, sector, we're actually in a very rapid phase of uh, innovation and change right now. So um, everything I'm saying in the next uh, minute or so could change in the next two or three years. Um, so don't hold me to it. But um, the research that they did really looked at would engineering do our species uh, line up in, in a way that is conducive to an uh, example you provided mass timber. And there are some challenges there currently. Not that they can't be overcome, but there are some challenges. Um, there are other factors like um, how much uh, source lumber do you need in order to get down to the really high source that you need for mass That really high grade lumber, uh, you have to pare down through a, a very wide funnel into a, a subset of, of high, high quality boards that are uh, capable of, of supporting uh, structural weight. And for those of you who don't know what master is, essentially um, large glued together uh, boards or small plaster. So, so things like that, um, it, it varied depending on the product. Um, in some cases, it was purely uh, a business consideration. There's uh, certain laws that are completely foreign to me regarding unions and, and how much uh, <laughs> folks are paid for certain uh, kinds of work that factor pretty large um, in the minds of investors um, looking to invest in California as compared to somewhere like the Southeast, where there's a very, very big wood basket and uh, quite a, a, a warm invitation for um, new facilities to be built. Hi, I'm Greg Suba from Sierra Force Legacy, and I want to also like to thank the panel for a very informative uh, presentations. I have, actually have two questions, a quick one for the host. I have colleagues that had difficulty on the, online, and I'm wondering if, if they were wondering if the presentations are available afterwards, um, so maybe you can address that after I have a question for Dan. Um, so I was following your 
conversation about and the trajectory of the obstacles that could stop appropriate thinning and burning in the Sierra Nevada, the clearing of the, the thinning of the vegetation. And you had those three scenarios uh, uh, that the analysis showed were the top three uh, economically, with, with the highest economic potential for success. And then at the end, you had a compelling slide showing the lack of, uh, of, of facilities around the TCSI area. And the numbers that you showed at the very end were about saw timber and how pretty soon those, uh, the, the amount coming out is, are going to glut those facilities and block them. And I missed the connection between taking out the small stuff and, and also now increasing how much saw timber we're, get, we're taking out. Uh, unless I'm, so the small diameter timber is equivalent to the saw timber, or are those different things? Yeah, if not, you. then where's the saw timber coming from? Yeah, no, thank you, Greg. That's a really good clarification. Um, so we, we focused, um, so the, the first definitional distinction that I tacked on to the very end is the Forest Service definition, which is anything less than 10 inches in diameter at about this height is classified as biomass, and anything larger than that is classified as, as saw timber. For, this, for the purposes of the model, um, we did not model removals of saw timber as it's thought of in the traditional industrial um, setting, which is to say merchantable logs that are you know, tend to be 18 to 24 inches. We specifically prioritized those stands that had um, hyper densities of smaller trees. Um, and it's impossible to dissect for any one area exactly um, what the diameter distributions were, but they tended to be um, on the, you know, sub 16 inch, sub 14 inch um, range. Does that answer your question? Very well, and I again, I want to thank TNC for doing the, the Yeoman's work on that uh, study, and um, I look forward to uh, reading all those reports in the TCSI, TCSI assessment as well. So thank you very much. And to respond to your first question, we do plan on posting the presentation. Thank so. you. Thank you. Uh, question for Dan. Um, I'm David Griffith with the Alpine Biomass Collaborative, and um, we've just in the process of completing a scoping study similar to what you've done, but of course on a much smaller scale. And we ended up with similar conclusions. And the problem is, as I'm sure you know, um, economic viability of biomass to bioenergy of some sort. And, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> So do you have any ideas of how uh, we can somehow get some financial support for the, un sorry, for the avoided costs that reducing the, the improving forest health and reducing the risk of catastrophic fire can do with bi or biomass can do? A uh, short answer is no, I wish I did. <laughs> um, longer answer is I, I think that's really uh, an integral uh, role for, for public policy, and I think it's the moment that that we're in. Um, your question's reminding me of uh, a saying that a colleague of, of ours, um, Craig Thomas, often uses. Um, he says, you know, who's controlling the calculator in terms of what we value? Um, and, and if we, in this room, were to control the calculator, we we tag some value onto wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, avoided uh, high severity of wildfire, all those things. Um, we're you know, obviously in the process of, of recognizing some of those values, but actually getting them to be monetized into public policy is a whole different ballgame. Um, I think efforts like yours, like ours, uh, really start to make that conversation real because it connects to real people that are trying to do good things on the landscape. So um, not, a, not a full satisfactory answer, but that's where we are, I think. Thank you. Uh, Richard Anderson, Nevada County Supervisor and also Sierra Nevada, uh, Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board Member. Uh, Pat, you had mentioned that one of your, one of your uh, scenarios was of urban development. Could you explain what that is? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's, attempts, it's 
expansion and intensification of, of the WUI, but I'm not entirely sure. And what implications would it have, if any, for, for local policymakers and for land use planning at the local level, at the county level and city level, if you know? I'm, uh, I'm not sure I know which statement you're referring to, but we have, I'll just sort of touch on three things and see which one it is or all three. So we, 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 we um, and Kristen mentioned this, that in the, the temporal modeling, we actually include um, urban growth. So where urban growth is expected to occur in the next, you know, 80 to 90 years. Um, that the other is that uh, it, these were these bands of, of treatment, these, these um, classes of land classes that were um, the defense zone, the threat zone outside of, uh, and then general forest and, and, and wilderness. And those were areas that were targeted for different kinds of treatment and um, throughout the, from scenario one to, to six. So just based on that, can you clarify your question? Uh, Yes. Uh, first of all, first of all, what is urban growth? Is it? Is it? I mean, is it? Is it? Well, sure. I'll answer that question. I guess um, the urban growth that model that we're using is one developed by the EPA. It's called ICLUES, and it projects out growth, meaning um, low density homes. So you know, not urban in the sense of like a town center, but homes spread um, out into the forest. Golf, golf courses are considered urban growth, um, other infrastructure that's related to people. So basically, the growth of people and people's homes and facilities into the forest is what we're trying to model, and it includes uh, climate change into that model. So how does climate change shape where people are going to move to in the future? If it gets colder in a certain area, for example, there's probably going to be, the, the model shows to be fewer people. That's just an example for less growth, basically. So we want to include growth in the model because it's a long time frame, out to 2100, and we think it's important to include along with forest management. So in other words, it's a model which, which assists us to, to, to analyze the disruptive impacts of, of growth, and, and also how growth is influenced by climate change. But, it can, but, but could it be utilized is there, is there the potential for these models or for the results to be utilized in, at, local, at the local level land use, or at lo, land use planning at the local level, at the county level, at the, city level, at the city level? That's a great question. I think we should look at the maps together and look at how it changes for your areas, and it'd be a great thing to think about is how could this be useful for your local planning. Um, from the fire standpoint, as you grow, as the people grow further into the forest and expand over time, the um, defense and threat zones expand as well. So that's, I think, important to consider when you think about the probability of ignition, which is being modeled based on past ignitions. Um, so ignitions happen a lot of times where the people are. Um, so I do think it's helpful to include the, the growth in the model. Thank you. And we had a question back here. Uh, well, this is bad if it goes on and on. Uh, Bob Johnston, Sierra Nevada Conservancy. I guess I thought I was missing something. I went through the whole day and never heard the definition of resilience. And then I realized that um, as good scientists, you're using the models to heuristically figure this out as you go, which is perfectly fine and a, and a really good way to do it. I just hope everybody knows that, um, the fun, for example. Uh, I, I think I heard people say a resilient forest is the one to four European settlement in this area. And then I thought I heard people say a resilient forest is one with lots of large trees. And then I thought I heard people say a resilient forest is one with lots of small openings. Um, I, but I never really heard the criterion for where they should try to get to, much less or economic resilience and the other, you know, harder to pin down tools. Um, I mean, it, it's okay to figure these things out and, whoa, uh, as you go along and play with your model and see what it allows you to do, but, I mean, at some point you have to pick. So, uh, could you comment on that? No, it's a great question. I think we, um, uh, 
we sort of intentionally didn't dwell a lot on that, but it's, a, it's obviously fundamental. Um, and so, um, you know, technically the definition of resilience is, is, is having a state that can, once disturbed, returns to, to that desired state. Um, probably not very satisfying necessarily or clarifying, <laughs> but that is technically the, the, the definition. And then when you start to apply that to a particular system, that's when it gets more challenging. Um, what kind of disturbance, um, what are characteristics of, of the state and returning from that state or leaving that state or maybe permanently moving into a new state. And that's where I think the kind of work that we're all doing are taking this, this sort of very general concept of a ball in a cup and what moves it out of the cup and um, how shallow or deep is the cup. <laughs> you know, all these things that, that come from the, you know, the fundamental, uh, the foundational theory of, of resilience to what does that mean for us today in these landscapes. And that's where, you know, working on, well, what's, a, what's a, a state that's desirable that has a little bit to do, maybe a lot to do with the benefits that come from those things. It also has to do with, um, you know, maintaining the parts and pieces, and that there's a sort of very old philosophy about that, <laughs> because we're, these systems are complex, and the adaptive capacity of these systems is very much affected by the composition, both from a, not, not only from terms of species or structure, but even genetics, and uh, in terms of adaptability over time and, and space. So there, these are sort of some of the elements that, that show up in the framework that we don't have a lot of time to get into, but that sort of you translate that to then, well, how do we characterize conditions that we believe are resilient to disturbances, and so these things like large trees, openings, and such, those are characteristics that that confer resilience to certain kinds of disturbances in certain systems, but they aren't measures of resilience per se. So that's something we, you know, I think we all agree on that, and it's easy to sort of jump to, oh, we have a lot of trees, we have a resilient system, or we have openings, we have a resilient system. It's, resilience is really a, how a system behaves. It's a behavioral phenomenon, and you usually only know if you have it by looking in the rearview mirror to see, well, geez, we had this disturbance event, how did, how did our system do? Uh, but we have a lot of, knowledge and information from this, the historical data, as, as Becky went into in, in, in great detail, that can help us understand what sort of characteristics might make a system resilient. Um, and then we move toward those. And um, it's not an exact science for finding it. It all makes complete sense from a scientific standpoint. Uh, I, was, I was misled by the one-way system that Dave Hughes had Yeah, I think I'll just reiterate what Pat said, that um, uh, the HRV is just one piece of understanding resilience. It's um, a met some the metrics that get us closer to measuring how systems can respond effectively to disturbances. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we also have to consider those social ranges. Those are important as well and help us define resilience when we're, you know, living in a different world than we did in the 1800s. Yeah, it's a, it's a, basic, a great basic concept, though, mm -hmm. and it's an artifact model that we can use. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Question back here? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, Jessica Morse, uh, Natural Resources Agency. And I just wanted to add a clarifying point on the earlier question about what resources do we have to support innovation in woody biomass and biomass utilization. The governor's budget includes a billion dollars for the Climate Catalyst Fund, um, which is you know under discussion over at the building right now. And so that would be across four years and investments in um, multiple areas, but it specifically calls out and includes wood waste collection and utilization, um, as well as sustainable forestry. So the sectors of innovation, whether you're talking about mass timber or biomass to energy or gasification, um, those are that Climate Catalyst Fund is there to give low interest loans um, to lower the risk for private investors and private dollars to come into the sector. So if that's an area that you're interested in, engaged in, I'd encourage you to engage in the public dialogue that's happening right now about it um, over with the legislature. Thank you, Jessica. Well, thank you for that comment. Uh, oh, sir. 
Uh, Terry O'Brien from the uh, Sierra Nevada uh, Conservancy Board. Uh, I have a couple of questions in terms of clarification. And uh, I think, uh, Kristen, when you were talking, you were talking about the various scenarios. And you mentioned scenario five. And then what I thought I heard was that uh, it looked at 27% of the landscape being treated. Is, is that correct? Right, so, so scenario five is the, and six are the greatest amount of treatment that we're modeling, and that was over 10 years, representing 27% of the landscape. And that amount goes down, it's that first 10 years, it's the greatest amount of treatment to reduce the biomass. And then over time, you don't have to do as much thinning. So the biomass, is like, you, go, you decrease the biomass initially, and then you have to do less work over time. Okay, and so, uh, you know, following up on that, uh, it's my understanding that basically, after you treat a landscape, uh, you ought to be thinking about going back uh, within 10 years, otherwise you haven't reduced your wildfire risk. And, and so the question I have is, why um, aren't you looking at a scenario that is more than 27%? Over the first ten years, you mean? Well, I, um, oh, so, you know, maybe I'm missing oh, maybe I'm missing something. But if we're going to get to the point, uh, which I think we want to get to, which is we want to restore our forests basically to what they looked like in 1850, that's going to require a huge amount of treatment on an ongoing basis, and so. What I'm asking is, are you looking at a scenario that gets us to that point as quickly as possible? And if you aren't, my concern is that uh, we need to be doing that because what we want to do is we want to push policymakers to think about how we have to get to that uh, you know, uh, landscape, that, that pre-European landscape, uh, what it's going to take and how long it's going to take. So the upper limit, like our upper limit scenario, you're concerned that it's not enough treatment, it's not modeling enough treatment. Well, I may, I may be missing something, but but yeah, that's, that's the concern I have. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, a, a great observation. I think it would, <clears throat> a little bit more detail might help in the sense that um, as Becky was describing in her work, they said, well, how frequently are these forests disturbed and, or, or, uh, and what sort of structures do those create? So you can get that from a variety of sources and um, uh, in, in our case it was from existing sites that have had frequent disturbance. So based on that though, there's an understanding of based on the, where these systems occur with different vegetation types and climate classes, they don't all have a 10 year disturbance cycle. If they're higher elevation, they're cooler, they're wetter, they tend to have actually a longer cycle. So certain parts, you saw that kind of a rainbow <laughs> climate zones that in, in one of um, Kristen's slides, each of those zones actually has a different return interval um, associated with it, longer and longer in many cases as you move up in elevation, um, because they're snow-based, uh, you know, uh, precipitation, et cetera. So um, the idea that, that uh, we need to treat every acre every 10 acres or every 10 years is only the case in areas that are high risk and so in the, the, the let's say the defense zone regardless of what kind of vegetation occurs there that might and we sort of assumed that that was the goal and then through the scenarios what we did was increase the frequency and the intensity from scenario one to five so that at five we actually were hitting this disturbance return interval um, uh, for every acre and that's where that percentage came and then we say like well if we hit this what we think is the right disturbance return interval whether it's with wild you know uh, low to moderate wildfire with prescribed fire or with mechanical thinning we hit that disturbance return interval on every acre as we think it's gonna you know uh, we think that historical conditions inform us uh, that then what do we end up with on the landscape you know how many trees do we have how much biomass do we have how many and then we can look at all these benefits or you know uh, outcomes. So the, the idea that we have to speed that up is, is actually, I think, um, our, our results aren't really bearing that out, that, that going faster than hitting this disturbance return interval right away is, 
it, that there are any benefits associated with that, but also that the capacity, um, as Dan's work has shown, isn't there to do that right away either. So I think it's really sort of digesting. I think you know your questions are great, and it's sort of how do we digest that? Where do we put our priorities in terms of um, having the, the most positive impact in the short term, given the limitations that we have on all these the, 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 the processing, the fundraising, and, and the, the implementation, and then where do you go from there as you ramp all of that up? And if I could just ask one follow-up in terms of, to, to Dan. Um, had, in terms of what your analysis, did you come to a conclusion as to how many campuses could be supported on an ongoing basis? That's the next phase of, of this work. So um, we will take the, the volumes and run them through an economic and transportation analysis. Uh, and that analysis will consider things like um, the price of uh, Douglas fir as compared to Ponderosa pine, and then the transportation distances, and so on and so forth. And um, once that's in place and the size sorts are all worked out, uh, what we intend to do is look at hypothetical um, uh, processing, additional processing locations with the lens of reducing the per acre restoration cost. And the, the principal variable there is, is haul distance because you know, logs are you know, at least 50% water, um, which is very heavy to, to move around. Um, so, so it makes the whole process very expensive. Someone told me recently that nobody considers transportation distance in the diamond industry because the value to the street is, is uh, quite different. So uh, that, that's the next phase. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt and ask you all to join me in thanking our panel members. Um, all of you for being here today. Um, the resilience conversation is a difficult conversation. It's a complex conversation, as is our landscape, as is in the political world in which we work. Um, and my purpose in sort of highlighting what we're doing on the TCSI is really to show that there are, there are big minds in the Sierra Nevada thinking about what it looks like to address those sort of overwhelming, terrifying issues that Hugh brought to our attention um, at the beginning of the speaker series this morning. Um, many folks were involved in the TCSI landscape. There are many of them here, um, and I think they all deserve acknowledgement. I want to encourage you to look at the back of your, your um, uh, summit materials. There's a list of one of those handouts that's in the back. Uh, there's a list of partners, but I do want to take a minute, a minute just to acknowledge some of the ones that I see in the room. And, um, this is an inexact science, so pardon me if I miss anyone. I want to start with Jim Brennan, who was my predecessor, um, and because it was he and Patrick Wright and some of the Morris supervisors, Ali Alano, who was here, um, and Jeff Marcellet on the Taha, Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit, who sort of came up with this concept that we really need to be doing work on the landscape in a very different way. Brought in David Edelson and the, the Nature Conservancy, who brought that environmental side of things and sort of that tempered look at what is, you know, we need to be working towards some very specific goals. This is a group effort. It's a long effort. It's a time-consuming effort, but it's an important effort. And I think some of them, and, and of course, these folks could talk for much longer about and get into some of the deeper dive questions um, about how we might use this model, or what that looks like, and, and so I would encourage any of you who are interested in having that conversation to reach out to me or members of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy staff because we can facilitate deeper dive conversations. But the value of this process that these big minds that came before me and um, you know put to put to work on this landscape is that this is a replicable process. This is a process that I think gets um, answers some of the questions that the folks in Sacramento are trying to answer now. I feel like. As a matter of necessity, the folks who are living and working in the Sierra Nevada region are ahead of the game. They have to be. The impacts there are huge. We need to be thinking about how we do work on the landscape. And so we just wanted to kind of bring you all together today to sort of highlight one process 
and let you all know that we are thinking about this and that it is important to think about um, and that we're hoping that we can connect what we're doing here um, with the funding conversations, with the policy decisions that are being made, just with the variety of conversations that are going on. So uh, we're past time, so I just I want to thank you all again for being here today, for staying with us a couple extra minutes. Um, thanks again to the panelists today um, and earlier today, uh, and to Secretary Profit and his team for hosting us as part of the speaker series. Um, thanks again. Thank you.